thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're super excited about this conversation. I'm here with Katie Spaulding. Um, she's a product manager of developer platform and ecosystem at Clary. And I've been lucky enough to have a lot of good conversations with Katie. I've kind of geeked out on this subject over the last, you know, um, five or six months. And so we're really eager to, you know, bring some of the conversation out to you all and hopefully it's it's beneficial. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is how to build your app marketplace. Um, so Katie actually just launched the integration hub is what they're calling it at Clary. And uh, so I figured she'd be the perfect person to bring on tons of firsthand experience on the on the topic. Uh, myself, I'm Cody. I'm the co-founder at Partner Fleet. Um, you know, we offer a platform for companies to launch their own app marketplaces. And so both of us kind of live in this world and excited to talk about um, you know, everything that we're that's going through our heads on a day-to-day -day basis. We did put quite a bit of structure to the conversation, even though we're going to try to like move it along as more of a conversational dialogue. But we did also want to make sure that we're hitting all the high points and making sure, you know, we get all that good stuff out to you. Um, so, Katie, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please jump in with an intro of yourself. I'm happy to. Thank you, Cody. Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining and spending some time with us. Um, today, I'm Katie Spaulding. My, I'm a product manager at Clary. Most recently, I worked at um, or worked on the, our developer platform and our ecosystem, which sort of culminated in this um, launch that just happened last week in partnership with a sort of partner fleet here for our integration hub. And that's what we, that's our sort of Clary name for our app marketplace. Um, before Clary, I was at Salesforce. And before Salesforce, I was a deep learning product manager at Intel. So I've been in SaaS my whole career. Um, and I'm really looking forward to talking about the product perspective of launching an app marketplace, an extensible ecosystem, a partnership ecosystem today with you all. Awesome. And uh, just so you all know the structure of the uh, webinar today. So we'll be chatting for roughly 45 minutes. We'll have another 15 minutes left over at the end for Q&A. We'll also do our best to keep up with questions as they come through in the chat. Um, but, you know, we might be a little bit in the zone on, on the topics that we're talking about here. Um, yeah, so glad to have Katie on here. The other thing I want to point out here is that obviously Katie works at Clary. However, she's not necessarily representing um, all of like, you know, Clary's perspectives and everything. She also has, of course, her own opinion on ecosystems, on app marketplaces and, and all of that. So a lot of this will be just general um, Katie perspective rather than just Katie from Clary. Right on. Um, so we're going to jump into it. I think where we wanted to start today is, first of all, like defining what is an ecosystem or more specifically, what's a platform ecosystem. And I know Katie has a good perspective on this. So if you want to jump in um, and just kind of level set with the audience on when we talk about ecosystems and platforms and all of that, what do we actually mean here? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're starting here because I think that there, there are terms that are thrown out quite often, but I want to just sort of anchor us around a common definition here before we get into the nitty gritty. So I think about um, ecosystems as being built on top of open platforms, not just platforms. And I think about this in maybe three phases. So you could think of the first phase as, you know, if you're a SaaS company, you might begin with building a standalone product. You might begin by building your own product, being really good at a couple bread and butter pieces of functionality. Um, but that might not be considered an extensible product quite yet, meaning a third party, you know, Snowflake or Gainsight or, you know, any name any other sort of SaaS company in your space might not be able to send their data to you or pull your data out of your product. You can think about it as sort of like having a wall around your, your standalone product, right? Second phase might be, okay, maybe at that point you, you plan on building an actual platform, which means um, not only are you maybe pulling data out of your own 
product and, and making it accessible in maybe a BI tool for your customers, but maybe you're also pulling external data from another third party into your product and really enriching your, um, your database, your data set with external third party data. But maybe in that second phase, you're still building each of those integrations yourself in house, which requires, you know, de dedicating a ton of development resources to each individual integration. I think of the third phase as sort of the goal phase. This is where we really have a true ecosystem, which means your product, your platform itself is actually extensible at that point, meaning any third party that wants to send you data. Maybe your customer wants to build their own um, custom integration to your product by calling some of your APIs or using developer tools uh, to build their own customized version of your product for their bespoke business. This idea is building, you know, the idea here is that you spend your time as your own company building tools, and then you hand those tools to the market third parties, partners, customers, who then help build a city with you rather than you building your own city yourself, all by yourself. Um, and when we say ecosystem here, when we say partners, we're thinking about um, we're thinking about third parties that care about sending you their data or care about taking your data out of your product and putting it somewhere else. So, um, you know, we want to think about this last phase as a true self-serve process. And that's where an ecosystem can really get off and running because then you've got, then you've got um, maybe healthy competition happening in your ecosystem amongst third parties that are trying to build the most innovative integration to your product. Yeah. Awesome. And obviously like, especially, you know, we're probably preaching to the choir a little bit here. There's a lot of hype around ecosystems right now, and it's definitely a buzzword. So, um, you know, like, let's go back to the, the roots of like, why do ecosystems matter in the first place? And why is it worth yeah. for a lot of companies to build an ecosystem and then consequentially an app marketplace? Yeah, I think about this all the time. So one of my favorite people to work with at Clary, he is an absolute legend. His name is RJ Filipski. He's our head of business development um, at Clary. He has built ecosystems. He's made a career of building really value-driven and fruitful ecosystems. Um, he is sort of infamous at Clary for saying ecosystems, not companies alone, create and win categories. What we're trying to do at Clary is something massive. We're trying to revolutionize and create a category around um, revamping the way B2B companies across the world run their most important business process, which is calling a number. And when you're endeavoring <laughs> to do something that big, you know that you can't really do that alone, right? We actually don't want to be the sole source of innovation as we create this category. We want to create this category alongside our customers and alongside our partners so that we're ultimately providing optionality for our customers. And we know that we can do a ton by ourselves, right? We can build a ton of innovation on our own, but we know that we can build a ton more and get the time to value faster with, uh, as we build alongside our partners and our customers. And RJ was also um, did a sort of similar, took on a similar endeavor at Qualtrics where he built out their ecosystem. And he thinks about sort of building an economy around your ecosystem, right? So not only are you, um, not only are you benefiting from third parties building integrations on to your product and from your product, but they're also incentivized to be there because they're um, expanding their market share by being associated with your brand. They are um, providing more value to your mutual customers, things like that. So we think about ecosystems as absolutely integral on this sort of category journey that we're on at Clary. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, at the highest level of an ecosystem, if you think about some of the big players in the industry, Salesforce, AWS, et cetera, like they have economies built around their business that drive revenue that's a multiple higher than what the actual um, company itself drives, right? So if you think about that, they're sort of 
in this position of being reliant on that that core company that the 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 ecosystem is built around and if that company goes away their revenue goes away or maybe their business goes away in a lot of instances so the motivation for those third parties to go support that company which the ecosystem is built around is massive right um so i think that's a really interesting yeah. point as well Right. And you think about something like a sales, right? Part of the reason they're the behemoth that they are today is because like, there are all these mom and pop Salesforce implementation partners, right? Living just these shops living across the country, across the world, whose sole job it is to, to, uh, in, to implement the Salesforce product. And they are, you know, they make careers out of learning that product in and out, and then maybe customizing that product for each of their customers bespoke business needs. So I think this is a really, you know, we can learn a lot from the likes of AWS and Salesforce in this, in this space. And I also think about, um, ecosystems and app marketplaces really help an individual company scale development and integration. And the way I think about that is that you can either, you know, that if you're in that second phase of innovation, you can still provide value to your customers through integration, but you are spending your own developers, your own engineers resources to make each individual integration. And that might take months, weeks, a year, depending on the complexity of the integration. The, this concept of, an, of a, a partnership sort of ecosystem flips that paradigm on its head. And it says, instead of building each bespoke integration, why don't we build individual, why don't we build tools for developers and hand those tools to third party developers so that they can build alongside us. And instead of spending all our time building individual integrations, we're actually building flexible, scalable tools. And then we're shipping ultimately integrations built in partnership with these third parties far faster. So we're able to eventually deliver far faster time to value if we focus on building the tools rather than the entire city. And I, Cody, I know you have a couple specific quantitative measures of sort of integration value in your head. You want to touch on that really quick? Yeah. And it's good timing too with, uh, with Brian's question. And so we're going to get into like, um, you know, how, uh, folks can get buy-in on, you know, building an ecosystem, an app marketplace, all of that as well. But I also want to run like just a theoretical model. Um, if you can follow along with some numbers here, right. To like put some value to building an e ecosystem and, and what your app marketplace can provide. So if you take a company that's doing a hundred million in ARR, and you say you're going to increase the adoption of integrations by one integration per customer, and then each of those integrations is going to increase that customer's retention rate by 5%. It's actually going to yield an increase of 13% in lifetime value. And so when you map all that out, you're talking about a $44 million revenue increase, right? Over the, the customer's lifetime that adopted those, um, you know, from all of them adopting one additional integration at a 5% increase in retention. So a lot of numbers there. But really, that's only one metric that um, your ecosystem can contribute to. You also have an increase in top of the funnel leads, right? You have an increase in sales conversion rates. Um, Katie was talking about when she was a um, SE at Salesforce, and she would always be in the app exchange trying to solution for you know customers or customers that were coming on board. So if you think about like in the sales process, being able to solution for your customers and be the consultative, you know, um, someone that they can lean on from that standpoint, those numbers are going to go through the roof. Sort of anecdotal, yeah. um, but that's like some of the inputs that you can start to think about as you build the business case to, you know, grow or expand your ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think um, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a really fair question from you, Brian. And one of the ways at Clary we think about the value of integrations is we actually think about like if you if you imagine our own product um, and then you imagine 
our customers' tech stacks, right? That are already coming with that customer when they evaluate Clary. They want to evaluate Clary and they've also had they also have a list of, you know, 15, 20 uh incumbent and sort of pre-trusted um, tools they already use. The way I think about integrations is integrations themselves help increase stickiness by digging roots from your product into your customer's existing tech stack, which eventually makes it far harder to rip and replace, right? The more time your customers are spending in your product, that's actually increased by the amount of integrations you can provide your customers from your product to their own existing tech stack. So then integrations help unlock far more workflows in your own product. Maybe we're really good at solving problem A, um, and we could be good at solving problem A and B in our own product, as long as we had a you know, couple more columns um, of external data in our, in our data set. If we bring that those columns, those additional columns into our own data set, then we're in, in essence expanding the workflows um, of our ICP from within our product itself. So I think about, you know, your product is really valuable by itself. Your product is even more valuable if it has roots into the rest of your integration or into the rest of your tech stack or your customer's tech stack. And those roots are integration, right? Those roots are like the mechanism of um, connecting your product or your standalone app to um, to the rest of a, a, a trusted and loved tech stack. And that can really only happen with an extensible platform. Awesome. Love it. Okay, cool. So let's get a little bit more into like the, the tactics here, like of actually building a marketplace. So one of the things we need to talk about up front here is when is the right time to platform and some of the technical prerequisites and business considerations. And then we'll get into your experience with the Clary Integration Hub and start talking about best practices for building the marketplace. Totally. Um, and yeah, Ali, I think that's a great question. You just posted in the chat. If you're behind, where do you start? Mm -hmm. I'll touch on that a little bit as we're walking through these technical prereqs. So um, let me first talk about you know where you should be before you start to think about becoming a platform. There's a ton right now. We're not really touching on like the 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 technical infrastructure ramifications or requirements needed to build an entire you know database or um, or the infrastructure to power a database. We're really talking about like what's the rest, the best time to build a partnership ecosystem built on a platform. And in that case, it's really important to start with a mechanism of allowing third parties to talk to your product, right? To take data out or put data into your product. Um, the most common place to start there is by building not only APIs, but public APIs. So public APIs, I think of as like the door to your house if your house is your product. Building a public API allows someone else who doesn't live in your house to open that door and like put something inside your house. If that, if they're putting something inside, if that's data, right? So it's really important to build those public facing APIs that can be accessible by someone who doesn't work at your company. And then we wanna make sure that the, the APIs are well-documented and make a lot of sense to that end user, to that, to that end third-party developer. Um, we want to also be able to allow third parties to access your APIs, right? That has to happen through credentials. Maybe that lives in your product as an API token. Maybe it doesn't. Um, we also want to make sure that we're giving those third parties a mechanism of, okay, so let's say we built the public API. We've posted it somewhere on our website. Um, a third party wants to build an integration to us. Great. So now they have the endpoints in the documentation but they need a mechanism of like testing out calling that endpoint, right? They need to make sure they know how to call that endpoint because as they call that endpoint or as they're building their integration to your product, they will be required to call that endpoint. That endpoint is gonna be their way of opening the door and putting something inside your house. All those things are super important. Now, um, business considerations and Ali, to your question of like, you know, 
if we're feeling behind already, where do we start? Do we start by um, letting, you're asking, do we start by letting third parties build to us? Do we, do, are we strategic in who we build with based on your current client base? I think those are all really fantastic questions. The RJ again has, has a ton of thought leadership all around this topic. And we take a page from his book all the time and he calls it priming the pump, right? So if you are starting with zero or very few integrations, you uh, might not have, might not be in a position where you, if you build a ton of public facing APIs or eventually developer tools, third parties will even know that those developer tools exist, right? Because maybe that ecosystem isn't sort of off and running in that flywheel quite yet. So a really good way to prime the pump is to listen to your customers, figure out the integrations they want desperately the most, either to or from your product, and then spend your own time and resources building a couple of those integrations to prime the pump. What you'll notice is like once those integrations are proving a ton of value to your customers, your customers will most likely ask you for more, right? They might say, oh, that's a really cool Slack integration. But that made me think of like, I, I also kind of want like this Google Calendar integration that and, and I'm really enjoying the first one you've made, but when's this next one coming? And once you get that kind of momentum in the market amongst your customers, that excitement in the market by priming the pump, then you can really start to, you'll, you'll probably start to see that third parties will say, hey, I saw you have an integration with Slack. I actually want to build an integration with you as well. Once you have partners interested in building to you, that's when you can give those partners the tools. So I would start with, if you're, if you're already behind, I would start by priming the pump by building your own integrations to begin with, and then see what that does to the market and see what kind of customer request you get from there. I also want to just touch really quick on, um, you know, let's say you already, you've already primed the pump, you've got those API documentation or those APIs well documented. Um, you, you're also wondering like, is it time to invest more in developer tools even beyond APIs? Is it time to uh, build SDKs, right? The, those decisions would really come down to, in my mind, what kind of things are your customers asking for? Like, are your customers telling you they want to spend more time in your product? Are your, That's a really valuable place to be in the market, right? Like if my customers love my product so much, they want to be in there more, I want to give them every opportunity I can to meet that, that um, request. And in order to do that, I might work backwards from what they're asking for, right? So if they're saying, I love your product so much, I'm only leaving to do X, Y, Z tasks, and I don't really want to leave your product to do so, then, then let's think about how to work backwards from there. Does that, what's the fastest way to get us from problem, customer problem to customer solution? Is it, um, in a lot of cases, you know, finding the right partner to build with you and then asking that partner what they need from you. Do you need APIs from us? Do you need SDKs from us? Uh, and then sort of solutioning is from there. So I would go customer request and customer value backwards. Awesome. I love it. And we got another good question in from John Hamrick about, um, you know, C-suite, eventually they're asking for leads, right? And so do you see marketplaces as a, as a big driver of leads as well? And, you know, so going back to a, a point we were making before on like, how do you get, you know, buy-in to go invest in your ecosystem? Um, the, the trends in the market right now are basically integrations are becoming a number one or number, you know, top three buyer consideration. And so what's happening in a lot of instances are like, Folks will go to your website to learn more about your product and they will um, they'll snoop around and, you know, your marketplace will often become one of your top three most visited um, web assets. And so they go in there, they figure out how exactly you connect into their existing tech stack and they convert either on the marketplace, which would be through calls to action that can be driven to your company directly or they're going to go to another asset that you have online and you know submit their interest that way, book a meeting with your team, et cetera. So um, wasn't initially a you know we didn't expect it to be a major lead driver, but it's turned out that uh, it can definitely be um, a lead driver. It's just not going to be necessarily like partner sourced leads, right? So it's a little bit of a different tracking mechanism there. So I hope that helps. Right. 
Yeah, I think that's such a fantastic question. I We've seen a ton of traffic already on our integration hub, which launched last Wednesday. It's been, what, almost a little bit over a week, and we're seeing a ton of excitement in the market around it. We're, I think it's important to think about, like, even I, as a consumer, kind of expect my tools or my accounts to speak to one another these days. Like, if I'm in Slack, I just want to automatically see what's going on in my Google Calendar when I'm in Slack. I don't really want to spend time finding the right Google Calendar tab. I just want it all to be in a single pane of glass. And I think you'll find that that is a really prominent consideration in the B2B SaaS world as well. There is a ton of value in individual apps, but there's so much more value when those apps speak to one another because what you're doing there is you're reducing friction for your customers. So you're not making them in order to, let's say for, for Clary customers, in order for uh, a frontline leader to run their business from Clary, we don't want them to see 98% of their business picture, but then have to leave for the last 2% because then maybe you're, you're, you're creating revenue leap, right? And Clary's entire, um, Clary's entire value prop is about reducing revenue leak, which is revenue you've already won, but have yet to close, right? Um, and what we want to do is give our customers a single view of their revenue and a single pane of glass. That can really only be accomplished by meeting our customers where they are and connecting to the things, to the other places where they might have revenue critical data, right? You can't run revenue. You can't run a complete picture of revenue unless you've got a single sheet of music for all of your reps to sing off of. And that sheet of music is com comprehensive if your entire revenue picture. I love the analogies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just full of them today, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great. I bet it's helping people out. So, all right. So when I first talked to Clary, the Clary team, um, there's already a project underway that, you know, Clary had already said, hey, we want to build an app marketplace. And there was, you know, it was kind of early in the process of like, all right, what's, you know, let's scope this out. How do we do it? What's the approach? Can you speak to what the whole experience looked like from initial scoping of that project all the way through to launching it last week, um, you know, from a high level, it doesn't have to be super detailed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this I, I learned so much throughout this process. So um, we initially thought at Clary, before we were even aware of, of marketplace platforms such as Partner Fleet, we initially thought we were going to just build this whole thing from scratch with a front end and a back end and tons of engineers, right, dedicated dedicating their time to building this, this marketplace from scratch. Um, then we noticed the market change a little bit, right? We noticed um, macroeconomic state alter a bit about a year ago, almost about a year ago. We we then started to reconsider, is it, is it the best use of engineers' time to build this marketplace front end and back end from scratch? Should we leverage a tool we already have? And in that case, it was our content management system, our CMS. So as we were you know, going through this process of figuring out like, What's the best use of development resources, um, especially given macroeconomic circumstances? We we built out a proof concept for this marketplace, which we've called the Integration Hub. Um, we built out a proof of concept using our CMS. Um, what we did there is I worked with our web dev, our web development team, our marketing ops team. I kind of borrowed some time with them, and they were so wonderful to lean in with me and build out, you know, a sketch of what we think this product could look like. Um, we learned a lot from that experience that right around that time when that POC was sort of wrapping up is when I learned about Partner Fleet and when I started talking to Cody. Um, at that point, I started to realize that there's like options to buy this thing we were trying to build from scratch anyway, and that we could actually spend more of our time instead of building this the another analogy here wow i just <laughs> can't stop instead of building like the store of the marketplace it, ourselves from um start to finish what if we spent more time um if we leverage something like a partner fleet or a marketplace platform on 
focusing on the, you know, the value of the integrations or the things that are on those shelves anyway. So going the ultimate decision to leverage a marketplace platform as sort of a vendor instead of building it from scratch or building with a CMS actually helped relieve us of a ton of development or configuration hours that allowed us to instead focus on our integration strategy, which I think was a really awesome spend of time. Awesome. That's good insight. And so I think, you know, now we can get into sort of like that, the meat and potatoes of like, what are all the considerations that anyone who's building an app marketplace should have as you look to, yeah. if you're going to build it in-house, like how do you make sure that you're accounting for the the entire scope of the project, right? Because I think feedback I get regularly, which was the case with Clary as well, was um, the project blew up to you know a much larger scope than we initially anticipated. Um, and so how do you create a holistic scope if you're going to build in-house and um, either way, what are the things and components that you want to make sure are incorporated into your marketplace? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, this was, well, first of all, when we, when I sat down and saw a demo of Partner Fleet and then did some due diligence in the market about like, what does the marketplace platform market even look like today? I was so excited because I realized we went from, you know, we were going from really tedious, time-consuming CMS build tweak to like, you know, this whole tool that does all of that already for us. Um, and I started to realize what the opportunity cost would look like if we went with, if we continued down the CMS path. Um, and so one of the reasons we decided to go with a buy versus a build is because we realized like, the not only was it going to save us time, it was also going to save us a ton of money. Even with license cost of this um, marketplace platform, we were actually going to save so much money in terms of the cost it would have otherwise taken to put individual clarions on this project. Instead, if we could outsource it and like use something that's pretty much already built and then you need some configuration. We were going to save time. We were going to save money. So it was already a cost saving exercise. Like going with a partner fleet was already going to save us time and money. And then from there, like we're, we're already in the green, but then there was so much more upside to when we started to think about the difference in functionality between using a CMS or building something from scratch and then using a marketplace platform um, and all the awesome sort of features that typically come along with those. Some of my, some of the things we love the most are um, the ability to kind of like log in and make changes to your integration hub or your marketplace yourself. A couple of days before launch, we had to change copy and like change some UI components. And if we built that ourselves, that would have been, you know, like what a series of a bunch of tickets in Jira. And we would have had to secure engineering time, which is, which would be really tough because it would take them away from something else they're already working on, make them context switch, which we want to avoid. Um, so instead I was able to like log into partner fleet and do all those changes myself, which was so easy. I can't even describe you how easy it was. Um, and that kind of brings me to like what attributes are most important as you're building out an app marketplace we decided to go with partner fleet with a marketplace platform um and i think that there are a ton of best practices here some of my key um you know my 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 top ones are about creating a seamless experience for your customers and your prospects not only between your website and your integration hub or your marketplace um, we wanted to make sure, and aside on that is we wanted to make sure that we, our branding was really seamless across our website and our, mar our app marketplace and partner fleet was super awesome in getting all of that sort of configured pretty perfectly to match with our new brand guidelines. Um, we wanted to create a continuous experience across website and app marketplace, but then we also want to create a continuous experience or a seamless experience between external facing app marketplace and then eventually an in-app marketplace where like if I'm searching, if I'm a 
customer inside Clary and I realize, ooh, I need a gain site integration and I want to turn it on pretty quickly, I can just go into the setup section of Clary. I can search for gain site and that experience will look just like me using the external website version of searching for gain site and the integration hub. Um, we also realize that customers almost never probably go from your product, your in-app product to your website. So we want to meet customers where they are and make sure they can just, um, you know, the, the, the integrations they need are at their fingertips and self-serve as much as possible. We I also want to make good. sure. Oh, on, go ahead. Yes. Point, real quick, Katie, too, is like, thank you for working yeah. partner fleet so much. I told her not to talk about partner fleet very much. <laughs> but we appreciate it. Um, but I keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you're going to build in house, I think the key consideration for your, your public and your in-app marketplace also is making sure that you have one source of content that pulls into your, you know, the marketplace that's going to be on your website and also in your app. So if partners have the ability to update content or you're updating content within one system, it's going to, you know, go out um, to both of those assets, both in-app and on your, your website seamlessly. And you're not going to have to like duplicate content and crazy stuff like that. Yeah. 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 That's such a good point. Like if you're, if the, I don't know, features of our gain site integration, for instance, or our cross beam integration, if they change then do I need to go update those prerequisites in two places or can I update them in one and just save time? Like that kind of stuff. When we're already so busy and we have a thousand other projects on our plate anyway, you just want to be able to save time as much as you can. Um, and then let's see. Next, I was also going to touch on the idea of like, making your integration hub or your marketplace super easy to find on your website so that you're not, you're, you're able to like highlight the extensibility your product already has in a really easy to find way um, on your website. We don't want to make customers have to search for it. Um, you also want the, the marketplace itself to be easy to use. Um, you don't want it to be overwhelming to users or prospects. You want to be able to, give them uh, the ability to like type in a, in a text box and search for the name of integration that they might want. If they don't find the integration that they want, you should, we also believe that we should give them a mechanism to request a new integration. That is actually one of the most valuable features we've been able to sort of leverage so far since launch last week, we've had a ton of inbound requests for new integrations that don't exist on our integration hub quite yet. Um, and by allowing our users to submit us requests, we're actually able to, um, you know, gauge the concentration of interest around different either categories of new integrations that we might want to build or um, new integrations themselves that we might want to build. Like if we're seeing integration with company A overwhelmingly, um, more than others. And I've already done a bunch of discovery with each of those requested parties to figure out why they want that integration and for what purpose and what problem they're trying to solve. Then we already have such valuable customer discovery data at our fingertips that we can use to say to leadership, hey, we're seeing our customers really, really want us to integrate with A. They want us to integrate with B a little bit less. How do we go make A happen as fast as possible? That part has been really awesome. And then, you know, other tactical things, you want to make sure that your, um, that your marketplace, you know, allows you, allows your users to like take action after they've already found an integration that they like. So let's use Gainsight as an example. Again, your I'm a, maybe a customer or a prospect and I'm on the Clary integration hub. I search for the game site integration. I grab it. I'm reading through, I'm figuring out like what's possible, what's not with it. Um, what do I do next? Right. You in a perfect world want to want to maybe even deep link, uh, create a deep link on that integration listing to your product so that the user can just like set up that integration themselves with the flick of the switch. Um, if not, if you need some, uh, if you need, you know, your CSM or your SDR team to kind of get involved, then maybe that get this integration CTA 
just sends them down the proper flow, depending on whether or not they're a prospect or a customer. You also want to make sure you're explaining every integration really clearly so that your users know exactly what they're getting. And then you want to be able to, as much as possible, show visual representation of this integration. And I actually prefer like product screens rather than marketing versions of product screens so that, uh, you know, a technical end user knows exactly what data is landing and exactly what place in your product. What about you, Cody? What are your sort of like best practices of an app marketplace? Yeah, I mean, you covered a lot of them. Um, so a couple that we look for too, you know, and I just mentioned this to John in the chat too, but like, think about your integrations as a core product feature, right? Your, your product features need to be marketed and promoted. You need to drive awareness, get customers and prospects excited about it all. Um, so one of the best practices, obviously, in the marketing realm is incorporating social proof. So having the ability to add in your testimonials, reviews, case studies, things like that onto the listings within your marketplace are going to allow customers and prospects to hop on a listing for a partner and say, oh, this is awesome, right? Like, this is exactly what I need. Yeah. A lot of people are hyping it up and excited about it. Um Sticking with the, the marketing theme here, it's really important also to make sure that the marketplaces are SEO optimized as well, so that um, all of your integrations can be found when people are searching in Google. And so, you know, what you can do is basically generate a lot of long tail terms and, you know, SEO from your marketplace. It's going to be like, for example, one is, you know, G2 HubSpot integration, um, if you can rank high for all those terms, you're actually going to drive a lot of net new traffic um, through your marketplace to your, your core website pages. And so you need to think about URL structure, having um, URL structure that plays nicely with us, uh, you know, search engines for your categories, for your listing pages, generating a sitemap so that the marketplace can easily be crawled by the search engines. Um, and then making sure that like any of your listing pages are shareable online with nice social images. So you don't have some weird image pop up when you send a link or like you post a link in LinkedIn, for example. Um, and also having a focus on page speed. There's a lot of content in these marketplaces and they can be bogged down pretty quickly. So having best practices around page speed is going to be really important there as well. And then lastly is getting into tracking and analytics. So either building out a, a native analytics function, um, being able to add script-based tracking, segment, pendo, things like that, um, utilizing Google Tag Manager, right? There's a, a bunch of different ways that you can sort of slice this. But the metrics that you probably want to track there are overall views by um, you know, by your partner listing and on your marketplace overall, like how many people are going there, how many clicks you're getting or interactions on different attributes within the marketplace, um, how many people are clicking your calls to action buttons and actually submitting their interest to a partner or to you. And then obviously off of that is like your leads generated, your integration installs and partner applications can be valuable as well there. Um, so I think like, you know, if you take everything Katie talked about, add in the things that I just mentioned, you're going to have a pretty, um, solid marketplace from a best practices standpoint. Now there is additional technical infrastructure that will be dependent on how you have things built up. We talked about some of those, um, technical prerequisites. So there might be a technical layer that comes after your marketplace as well to enable that workflow for the customer. And then lastly here, we wanted to talk about sort of the value of having a partner portal for your marketplace, right? So the ability to intake and manage partner applications um, and basically, you know, uh, outsource the content creation side of the marketplace to your partners by inviting them in, giving them a nice interface to go fill out their listing. It already includes all the different sections that you want incorporated there. Um, to be honest, the, the content creation part of a marketplace is often the biggest lift. 
Um, especially if you have hundreds of listings, it's going to be pretty challenging to go get all the content together with your own resources. So crowdsource that information for that content creation from your partners. And each of them just builds one listing works pretty well. Um, and then they'll, they'll make any of the updates over time as well. So the marketplace becomes very scalable. You don't have to do that process like Katie talked about of, you know, going and getting it um, prioritized on the development roadmap and all of that stuff. And then the last okay. component here is you're upgrading the partner experience, right? Having the ability to create some roles and permissions for different types of users to create unique um, unique experience when they land in the partner portal, and then having the ability to send leads straight out to your partners. You know, from a partner experience standpoint, it's probably going to be like the number one thing that gets them most psyched is when they get leads from you. So having a clear path to generate leads for them and send them straight into their CRM or their scheduling link or whatever the case is there. Awesome. Throwing a lot at you all. We did so it. <laughs> Actually, I'm I'm excited to see. Like, we still have most of the attendees uh, here, you know, on with us. So, really appreciate um, all the time that you're spending here, Katie. Unless you have anything else, we can go into Q and A. I think that sounds great. Yeah, I was actually just looking at um, Cadu's question. I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly, but um, they're asking about, you know. Right now, it looks like they're building at high graph a lot of their integrations themselves, but it takes a ton of time and effort. In the long run, that doesn't feel sustainable. So what are our, what are our tips for convincing third-party partners to build and maintain their own integrations? I think this is an interesting question because it gets that, like not only the time and effort it takes to build the integration first round, but like as a product manager, I think all the time about what does the first revision actually entail? What does MVP entail? What does sort of GA or alpha beta entail? And like, how do I know when I'm done? And then also, how do we account for resources across every phase of a product lifecycle? Because it's not done when you release V1, right? Like oftentimes V1 could be an MVP. So this, I think, is a really good point. Um, the the question of like, what are our tips for convincing a third party partner to build and maintain their own um, often comes down to, in the best case scenario, comes down to whether or not, or sort of how badly your mutual customers with that third party are asking for this integration. So if we've got mutual customers with a third party and our customers are desperate for this integration, that already hopefully incentivizes each, both us and that third party a bit to like put some time and effort into making, delivering value to these customers in the way that they're asking. Um, from there, I think it like kind of flows right back into whatever software development process you're thinking about. Like if that third party cares a lot about serving those mutual customers, then they will be more incentivized to put development resources towards maintaining the integration long-term. Now, um, this comes back to the idea of, you know, how valuable are the products you're building themselves? And if your third party is interested in like building it and then never touching it again, then that's maybe a different conversation to have between product teams about like, what's our plan for both having skin in this game and making sure our customers are serviced not only now, but like long-term, what happens to this integration long-term? I think there's a lot of ways you can go about this too. Maybe there's a shared responsibility model. Maybe there is a, that third party is so excited about having their name next to your name that they're willing to put a ton of dev resources towards um, maintaining this integration long-term. Um, either way, I think it just comes back to the, to like product mindset, right? Are we are we building a, a an integration to just get it out there and then never think about it again? Or are we building an integration like we build any product and do we care about its long-term success? If so, we have to factor that, um, that long-term maintenance into the rest of our product plans and roadmap. Yeah, absolutely agree. And like from a tactical standpoint, go find your customer overlap if you have data on how many times an integration with a third party has been requested 
and you can bring that to the the potential partner. I think that's like pretty compelling information to bring to them. You know, you're ultimately going to have to pitch um, a little bit and explain the scenario why you're unable to put the resources forward, but why it would be valuable to both parties. Um, and that's the great thing about an integration is, you know, the benefits that you get from integrating don't just impact you. Um, and, it, you know, don't just create value and upside for you. They also create value and upside for your partner. So if they have the appetite, they have the infrastructure to do it um, scalably and without too much effort, then, you know, you, you might just have a shot at convincing them to build and maintain. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Super fair. Um, um, Daniel asked also, what are some residual benefits yeah. of marketplace slash integration, short-term, long-term that can encourage a company's leadership team to aggressively develop these tools? Yeah. Um, what, I'll just bring up one sort of anecdote that I've seen is like, that we didn't expect another one that we didn't expect um, when we launched partner fleet customers started to come to us and say our customer success and our sales teams are actually like the most excited about having a marketplace because they didn't have enablement material they're kind of always stumped when a customer or a prospect would ask them about the partnerships that they have and the integrations and how they work and everything a lot of times those customer facing team members would have to go to a technical counterpart, a product manager, a tech partner manager, and get that information and relay it back to the customer. So now, you know, with the marketplace, we're basically equipping the uh, customer facing teams to, um, you know, essentially be a lot better at working with their customers and being that like trusted advisor for them. Um, so that I think that goes a long way. That's just one thing that came to mind for yeah. me real quick. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that there's some, I think that it oftentimes comes back to like partner appetite, which is almost always fueled by customer appetite. So if we are in a position, like we hope to be in a position where partners are sort of clamoring to be associated with um, our brand, right? And we, in in that case, like there is very little convincing that needs to happen. If you are building a product that is sticky enough and um, valuable enough that other third parties are like really desperate to be not only sort of have their logo next to your logo, but also, um, but also really excited to build an integration with you all, then a lot of that you know, need for uh, convincing goes away. Oftentimes that appetite from partners could also come from mutual customer appetite. So like if mutual customers we have with third party A are saying, hey, we really love Clary and we really love your data, but we want them to be in the same place. Can you get your data into Clary? Um, then and I've noticed oftentimes that does some of the convincing for us. I think it, for us at Clary, it comes back to customer value just over and over again. And so if we're getting those kinds of um, customer requests, and then if customers are surfacing those to partners and then giving us partner requests, then um, that gives us a really good starting point to figure out what to prioritize and when. Um, yeah, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. We got another one from Ali here. Do you have any data on how many leads typically come from a marketplace? Could be a loaded question. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that, Ali. And it's a good <laughs> question. I don't have great data on it, to be honest, because the range is so vast, right? We have we have customers that their um, their marketplace is like one of their most visited web assets, and they're driving a ton of traffic there. They're driving a lot of leads through it. And then we have, um, you know, other customers who have like, they never added the marketplace to their homepage or like they didn't fully implement, right? Like they, and it's just, it's not going to get the same traffic. It also really depends on the other programs that you put in place. Do you have your marketplace and all of your partner listing pages weaved through your content creation strategy? Right? Are you are you linking back to the marketplace on a regular basis as you develop and distribute content or not? And there are other approaches to just drive more traffic to your marketplace, but 
ultimately you need a marketplace dynamic, which is the supply of your partnerships and integrations and the demand, which is the traffic going to the marketplace for this interaction to take place and people actually adopt, which could be in the form of integration installs or leads being generated. Yeah, 100%. I also, I noticed John asked a question about a couple of parted or a sort of a question with many parts, but I think we might have already addressed the the first parts. The last piece, I think, is a really important point around, do you think the marketplace should align more with the product team or the sales team? The way I'm interpreting this question is, um, do we think that the marketplace and I would imagine subsequent integrations should be driven more so by sort of like sales team perspective or product team perspective. Mm -hmm. This to me gets at, this question is interesting because it gets at one of the fundamental philosophies of product management. And I think in, in, especially in the B2B space, I, as a PM, love working with, um, with people in sales, because in my mind, they are this really valuable window into uh, customer feedback and like market desires. So they are this fantastic aggregation of um, market insight that I don't have on a day-to-day -day basis because I don't spend as much time talking to customers, although I do spend lots of time, just not as much as salespeople do. And I so value the things that they tell us their customers need, right? Like in my mind, I think of our sales team as one of my customers. Now, because I'm a product owner, it's also incumbent upon me to think about like, what is, what is the sales team need versus what does the long-term vision of my product need versus what does the business need, right? Like product owners just cho our job is to weigh a ton of these different requests and priorities across a holistic uh, image of your product roadmap and your product vision. But I think of the sales teams as having a massive hand in helping us decide where we go next and for what reason, because they're the ones with the closest finger on the market. Thank you for clarifying that too, Katie. I misunderstood that in my response in the chat to John. So um, oh, great, no, great answer there. Um, so we are fresh out of time. I feel honored to have so many people engaged in, you know, uh, riding along here. Really appreciate you all um, asking all your questions and everything. So hope the discussion was helpful for you. Um, feel free to get in touch with either of us. You know, you can go to partnerfleet.io and uh, get in touch with me that way or Cody at partnerfleet.io. Katie? Any sign off? Cool. Yes. Yeah. My um my LinkedIn is uh in that chat for everybody who who needs it. Um, I'm happy to chat at all times about all things sort of SaaS and, and product management. So let me know if you have anything. Um, you can also find me at kspalding at clary.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Katie. It was awesome. Really appreciate it. Have a good one, Thank everyone. Thank you, Cody. Talk <laughs> soon. Bye.